From the Alabama Public Television Statehouse Studios in downtown Montgomery, welcome to Capital Journal. I'm Randy Scott. Todd Stacy has the day off. Coming up on the program, we'll talk to State Representative Napoleon Bracey from Mobile County, who is running for congressional seat in Alabama, the new redrawn District 2. We'll also introduce you to a new proposal before the Alabama House of Representatives, which could bring help to Alabama's health care system. Plus, a school in historic downtown Montgomery that's carving its own place in history. But first, today's news. The Alabama legislature will start the new 2024 regular session in a matter of weeks, but many people are asking what could possibly be on its agenda. Recently, the Speaker of the House, Nathaniel Ledbetter, shed a little light on that topic. Here's Capitol Journal's Todd Stacy. The 2024 legislative session is less than a month away, and legislative leaders are busy getting their ducks in a row. This week, House Speaker Nathaniel Ledbetter shared his legislative outlook during a gathering of the Montgomery Chamber of Commerce. At the top of his list is improving Alabama's workforce participation rate by making it possible to get able-bodied workers off the sidelines. Even though our unemployment's low, we got 43 percent of the people that's working age in our state that does not have a job. Now I'm not going to say I'm not blaming that on them. You know, I'm not going to say well, they just need to find a job. There's plenty of jobs out there. There's a lot of issues that goes with that. The latest report shows Alabama's workforce participation rate is just 57.1 percent well below the national average of 62.8 percent. Recent survey data has shown that multiple factors keep people from joining the workforce. Among them, lack of transportation to and from work, lack of affordable child care or care for aging parents, and the risk of losing health insurance benefits through Medicaid. Because Alabama is one of just 10 states that hasn't expanded Medicaid, adults with qualifying children must make no more than 18% of the poverty line to qualify for Medicaid. That's just $2,673 a year for an individual or $4,475 a year for a family of three. So for some people, getting a job that doesn't offer health insurance could mean losing their benefits. Ledbetter said finding a solution for the more than 300,000 Alabamians in that coverage gap is a conversation worth having. I think it's just the conversation stage. You know, the problem we got right now, we've got so many hospitals that's in dire straits, and we gotta have the conversation. We cannot have it. And so I think we'll continue to work on the public-private partnerships, certainly something that we need to look at. I think it gives the, the people that, that's in the gap better insurance and, and Medicaid, and, and maybe, uh, Maybe maybe also helps keep some people on the rolls and so that wouldn't have to come off as far as being on commercial insurance already. Ledbetter said he's also expecting legislation on education. School choice will again be debated, but also investments in the Alabama Literacy Act and the Alabama Numeracy Act. I think we're gonna make strides. You know, the thing about it is, and I think it's important that we know this, the education system in Alabama didn't get this way overnight, okay? And I know we're not where we want to be, but we're not going to fix it on that. But I do believe we've got programs in place that's going to fix it for the future. State Superintendent Eric Mackey was in attendance and applauded the speaker's comments on building on education successes. We're very excited about this session because the last two or three sessions have been really good for education. The speaker mentioned this morning uh, the Numeracy Act and Literacy Act, two of the most important things the legislature has ever done in, in the history of this state. They're already making a huge difference. Um, and remember, we're just we're barely into implementation of the Numeracy Act. So I think that uh, we're going to see in the next five or six years huge growth in the state because of that investment. The legislative session begins Tuesday, February 6th. For Capital Journal, I'm Todd Stacy. This week, U.S. Senator Tommy Tuberville spoke to his fellow senators about the importance of bringing more nuclear power to help bolster America's energy production. Tuberville says it's time to look more into this alternative power source. So, Mr. President, I come to the floor today to talk about the need for more American energy. We are now in the coldest time of the year, the demand for energy is going up as people try to keep warm. 
This is placing a strain on our power grid across this country. Uh, this administration obviously has no solution for this problem. I think they're adding to the problem. The Biden administration is on a crusade to make us dependent on unreliable, renewable resources like wind and solar. We need an all-above approach to American energy production to keep prices low and capacity high. We have to have it. And how do we do that? We do it by investing in nuclear power. The polls show the American people are becoming more and more supportive of nuclear power. There's no doubt about that. A clear majority of the American people want and need more nuclear plants. This should be a bipartisan issue. Let's look out for the American people. It's good economics. It's good energy policy. It's good for our environment. And it's long, long overdue. The Alabama Department of Public Health is encouraging people to keep their guard up against respiratory illnesses and diseases such as COVID-19, pneumonia, and the flu. Dr. Wes Stubblefield says even though the CDC and Alabama's Public Health Department tracks changing conditions, citizens should also stay alert. These respiratory viruses are circulating in our community. They can cause in certain individuals very severe disease. Um, and it's important for everyone to be cautious, especially with loved ones and those that have underlying medical problems that may make them more susceptible to severe disease. Coming up next, State Representative Napoleon Bracing will join us. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online at video.aptv.org. Capital Journal episodes are also available on APTV's free mobile app. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. And you can listen to past episodes of Capital Journal when you're driving or on the go with Capital Journal Podcasts. Recently, Alabama lawmakers had the task of redrawing district maps for the state of Alabama. This after the latest census. Now there's a new district that's going to require a election to elect a new member of Congress. One of those members of Alabama's legislature that had a, a big hand in working those maps is here joining us now to talk about that. That's Representative Napoleon Bracey from the city of Mobile, Pritchard. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Brenda, thank you for having me. Let's get to you. You have been in the Alabama legislature now for how many years? And what prompted you to get into the Alabama legislature? Um, currently in my fourth term um, in the Alabama legislature. Before coming here, um, I served six years on the Pritchard City Council. So um, I've had about 20 years of service uh, to this community. Um, this has been a, a great opportunity for us and uh, the creation uh, of this new district uh, is pretty unique. Um, it's creating an opportunity for us to elect a member of Congress uh, from South Alabama and possibly the second black congressional member. Um, so it's something that we've never had uh, here in this state. Uh, this district is created based off of a lot of uh, cities, towns, communities, uh, counties that feel that they have not had the opportunity for fair representation on the federal level. And uh, just like so many things that happen in the state of Alabama, we can fight over these things in the legislature, but sometimes the courts have to step in to force the state to do the right thing. And uh, that's how this district uh, was created. Um, as I mentioned, I served six years on the city council before coming to the legislature. I'm in my fourth term now, and I've served citizens that will be voting in this second congressional district now for 20 years. And uh, I think it's a great opportunity um, for the district. And uh, I think it's just a natural progression uh, for me for being someone that's been on the ground, understanding the issues, fighting for those citizens for a long time um, to move in this direction to continue to take that fight to Washington, D.C. As you said, you've been in the Alabama legislature for a number of years, and then this comes about. It got national attention because the discussion about redrawing districts got a little contentious in the state of Alabama and mm -hmm. you were trying to explain, you and members of the House and Senate, were trying to explain 
why this was needed and why it should be needed. Mm -hmm. And do you think the message got out to the citizens as to why this was something that the state had to go through? Um, not sure if it got out to the citizens, but it actually did get out to the courts. You know, it was lawsuits filed that would create this district that would give us this opportunity. Uh, black people in the state of Alabama uh, make up 27, 28 percent of the population. And that's not one of seven. That's closer to two of seven. And that's why we have this opportunity now is because you have to do these things based off of the population. As you mentioned earlier, it's based off of the census and black people deserve the opportunity to elect their candidate of choice, uh, which we tried to tell uh, the Republican supermajority in the legislature. And now it took the courts to step in to tell them as well. So you've been in the Alabama House of Representatives for a number of years. Why make the jump to Congress? Um, because it's needed. Um, our citizens have been suffering a long time by not having the opportunity for federal representation. Uh, this gives us that opportunity. Um, it's a lot of things that we've been working on that we think we could expand across this district that will benefit uh, many, many citizens. Um, economic development is really, really important. It's something that I've been working on a lot, uh, also with workforce development, making sure that we have good paying jobs in this district where people can actually make decent wages to be able to take care of their families. Uh, providing opportunities for people. That's really big for me. Uh, when we go out and recruit major industry to come to our areas, we know that Mobile and Montgomery are the anchor cities within this new district. But we have so many other uh, cities, towns, and counties outside of Mobile and Montgomery that should be able to benefit from these anchor companies coming in by helping to set up suppliers in, in some of those other areas so people wouldn't have to drive an hour or two hours to go to work just to be able to make a decent wage. We can layer those things out and I think that is something that the congressional office should have a hand in. Um, education is very important. Um, in Mobile, uh, we have something that we call signature academies. Signature academies are creating a direct pipeline from students to get training needed in high school to be able to transfer that over to get paying jobs as soon as they graduate. That's something that we've seen. It's been working in Mobile. We've been doing it uh, for the last 10 years. And that's something that we should be able to implement across the board. Healthcare, our rural hospitals are closing. We need to come up with a strategy to offer the state one last opportunity to expand Medicaid. We need to give them that opportunity. Our rural hospitals are closing. Our hospitals in Montgomery and Mobile are being crowded because people are having to travel far distances for minor things that should be able to be taken care of at home. Um, so those things are something that's really key. Think about our veterans. Our veterans fought hard. These are benefits that they deserve. We should have to, we should cut through the red tape to allow our veterans to have the opportunity to receive the benefits that they need and that they've already earned. They should not have to go through a lot of red tape to get what they what they already deserve. And I think those are issues that are very important. Uh, we have a great military base uh, in Maxwell Gunner that's right here in the Montgomery area. Uh, we're building ships in Mobile. We think the defense budget is gonna be really important. We need to make sure that we support our veterans and we need to focus in on the key issues uh, around this district. One of the things that stick out to me more than anything is access. Uh, when I speak to mayors, county commissioners, and just everyday citizens, they want to have access to their member of Congress. That's something that I've preached um, since being an elected official for the last 20 years, representing people that currently live within this district. You will have access to me. You will see me at the grocery store. You will see me at church. My children go to school where your children go to school. I've attended every public school I've ever attended is within District 2. I am the home candidate for this election. People know my work. They've seen me. My, I married my wife outside of District 2. I found her in Trinity Gardens, right in Mobile, in District 2. My family is from Clark County. My grandfather had a farm in District 2. My parents moved from Clark County for an opportunity and they moved to the Mobile area to the Happy Hills projects. And then they moved over by the Bessemer projects and eventually settled off of Pritchard Lane. 
But all of this happened within District 2. And when my parents passed away and my brother and my sister and my grandparents, my family is buried in Clark County in District 2. District 2 has always been a part of my life and a part of my family's life and our parent family's history. And it's who we are. And that's why some people may be surprised that I'm leading in the polls. I'm leading in the polls because I'm a homegrown candidate and I'm from this district. And people know me and they know my work and they know what I stand for in this district. That's why I'm leading in the polls because I don't have to go out and buy name ID to try to win this election. It's because people have seen the work that I've done over the last 20 years by being the homegrown candidate on the ground fighting for the citizens of District 2. And that's what I've been doing for the last 20 years. And I just ask the citizens to give me the opportunity to continue to do what I've already been doing and take that to Washington, D.C. You have been doing this for the last 20 years, as you've said. So why make the jump to Congress from leaving Alabama to jump to Congress? Why make that jump? Are you concerned about how hectic things can be? Uh, no, sir. Um, I don't know if you heard me in the beginning, but I was on the city council in Pritchard. That was tough. <laughs> okay, that was that was that was tough. Um, and being in the super minority here in Alabama is tough as well. But to go to Congress and represent people that feel that they have not been represented before in their lifetime, I think is an opportunity of a lifetime to represent those people in that district. Uh, we have fought hard for a long time just to have federal representation and to know that it can finally come to pass. We can finally have someone uh, with a seat at the table that will take care of and handle the issues that have plagued our communities for so long. I think that's a big deal and it's a big step and someone has to do it. I don't think that we should have people to come from miles away to come and represent a district that I've already been working hard in, already been representing. Um, we have many people from around the state and even coming from other areas like Washington, D.C., moving back. We've already been here. We've been on the ground. We've been working. Where were these people when we needed them to help us with the issues that we've been facing in the southern part of the state? Um, when you talk about from east to west and you talk about Montgomery South, where were these people? And all of a sudden we have this congressional district, everyone wanna show up when we've been fighting the whole time. Speaking of that district, it has changed literally physically in size and how it, the area that it covers mm -hmm. due to the redrawing of the maps. Mm -hmm. uh, are you concerned about that? Or are you uh, uh, ready to take on that challenge as well too? I'm ready to take on that challenge as well. Um, I'm gonna speak with local leaders. I've already started that uh, to make sure that when we set up our congressional offices, we'll have one uh, in the southern part of the district. Uh, we'll have one here in Montgomery. And we're also looking at where we'll have our third office. Um, we're also looking at uh, working with the county commissioners um, throughout the district to make sure that we have an opportunity to take uh, Congress into the community and make sure that the constituent services are being met right where they're needed. And we wanna be um, accessible to the citizens and make sure that we have people on the ground in these rural areas as well so they don't have to travel miles to have their issues uh, concern uh, met. We have uh, forms that we'll have them to fill out that will allow us the opportunity to speak on their behalf if it come down to any federal issues that they have to make sure that their services, uh, they get the services that are requested and that are needed. Uh, we already have that infrastructure in place and that's something that we're really gonna push for to make sure that the constituents needs are met throughout this district. So if anybody's looking for more information mm -hmm. about you and your campaign online, where can they go to, sir? Uh, they can visit us at um, NapoleonBracy.com. Uh, you can look me up at uh, Napoleon Bracy for Congress on Facebook, uh, Hip Hop State Rep on uh, Twitter and Instagram, and also Napoleon Bracy on Facebook. He's Representative Napoleon Bracy, who has also tossed his hat in for Congress here. Thank you for joining us, sir, and thank you for your time. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, remember, vote Napoleon Bracy on March 5th. 
Um, and I know you're a resident of Montgomery. Uh, <laughs> I would appreciate your vote as well. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. And Capital Journal will be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online anytime at Alabama Public Television's website, aptv.org. Click on the online video tab on the main page. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. The Alabama State House is a little quiet right now, but pretty soon lawmakers from around the state will come here for the new regular session for 2024. They've been working on proposals year round to get ready to represent the people and the state of Alabama. Joining me here now is one of those representatives, Representative A.J. McCampbell from Galleon, Demopolis, Alabama, here to talk about some bills and proposals he's looking at, as well as some other things that could possibly come up for this upcoming regular session. Representative McCampbell, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me, Randy. It's uh, indeed a pleasure to be here with you at Capitol Journal. Dare I say, it seems like we just left a few minutes ago from the last <laughs> session, but that's not the case. There's been some time and been some downtime, and people are always asking me, so what do you do when lawmakers aren't in the building? Well, first of all, you and your fellow representatives and members of the legislature are here literally year round. It may not be in large groups, but you're always here and you're always working. Yes, we're, we're always coming in uh, because there are different things that we have to do down here as we go throughout the year. As you are working in your district, there will be some things that will come up. Uh, for instance, I needed to talk to someone about a constituent that was having some problems with, uh, his un with unemployment. I came and I had a conversation and, you know, visited with them. Uh, regarding this particular issue and I got a call about three days after my visit down here and they s said well thank you so much for uh, at least getting them to call me back because that had been the problem but I, I appreciate the department they got right on it when when that when I spoke with them about it so there are many things that we do once we're down here in in Montgomery so the people's house is pretty much open seven days out of the week, 365 days of the year, even though you have your regular session or special session, dare I say, that you are down here with members of the house to do work. And the people can come and talk to you. The people can come and talk to me and I'll make efforts to either meet them where they are or we can meet down here at the state house as we did that particular day. Now, year round, lawmakers like yourself, you're working on proposals and bills year round to present to fellow lawmakers to talk about what people need and what people have said they needed to see if you can get some work and some traction done to them. We were talking earlier about a new proposal that is quite interesting and it deals in a way, correct me if I'm wrong, with health care, which is a big issue here in this state health care in terms of making sure it has enough people to carry it on. Tell us about that proposal, sir. Yes, um, last year the governor in her uh, budget sent over a proposal for a health care high school in the state of Alabama and the location was to be over in the Demopolis area uh, and this came about from a collaboration between the people of Demopolis and UAB Hospital. UAB has come as, as small counties and small towns and rural hospitals are closing. The larger hospitals, some are beginning to partner with the small hospitals. We were fortunate that UAB saw an opportunity to partner with uh, the the regional hospital there in Demopolis. And so now UAB actually has uh, a, lot of, a lot of their students coming to Demopolis to actually learn some things and do some processes down there. They, they've got, oh, I don't know how many students actually are coming. But one of the things that they found out 
was it gave their students an opportunity to take a patient in and then be able to follow the whole process of the patient until they are discharged, as well as the follow-up on that patient. Whereas in their larger hospitals, uh, you may have someone triage in in the uh, emergency room, but then that doctor would lose sight of them because he'd pass them on to somebody else. This gives these uh, students an opportunity to understand what rural medicine is about. Rural medicine is an opportunity for you to touch that patient throughout the whole process of their, uh, of their stay or of their time there. So. Now, you mentioned something, and I want, to, I, I want to mention that before I lose track of it. The fact that Alabama has seen a lot of hospitals in various areas around the state close, which has been, I, I, I know, listening to lawmakers, a big concern from north, south, east, west, losing hospitals in various areas, and not just rural hospitals, but especially rural hospitals, since in many cases they may have to treat people in up to four counties at one time metropolitan areas as well too so this is something that is of keen interest to lawmakers is it not sir it is a very keen interest to lawmakers and i say that because i just lost a hospital well we didn't just lose it. it's probably been two or three years but i just acquired the area as a part of my district uh, that's over in pickens county the pickens county hospital has been closed for a few a few years now and so the people in Pickens County are actually having to drive 40 40 miles 40 miles either way north south east or west before they can uh, get to a hospital now the other thing that has happened is their ambulance service has been moved instead of having an ambulance service located in Pickens County they now have an ambulance service that has to come out of Tuscaloosa to service Pickens County. That's time. That's time. And sadly enough, we, we had a situation where a young, uh, young father, a father of two, uh, had a, a major uh, heart attack or whatever it may have been. But his young sons had to stand there and wait on an ambulance to try and get there, and the father pa passed. Mm -hmm. These are the challenges that we are having out in rural Alabama when it comes to health care. And I'm, you know, there's 105 of us in the House and 35 of us in the Senate. You know, but the majority of those of us that are in the House and in the Senate actually have service areas that are, are health care deserts. And when we are dealing with these health care deserts, we honestly need to understand we are dealing with the lives of those people that we are actually elected by to, to advocate, to work for, and to service their needs. So I'm going to be with this healthcare science school, which is, is uh, a novelty. There is none in the whole United States. First, it's of not its, first of its kind. First of its kind in all of the United States, not just Alabama. This is a novelty for the United States. And what it's designed to do is help build us a healthcare workforce but a workforce that has the opportunity to understand the needs of the areas that they are actually servicing, uh, working in. Uh, the UAB in the partnership actually wrote uh, us a, a proposal for this uh, healthcare science school. It's a high school. It's not, and it's, it doesn't say doctor or nurses. It says health care. So not only will we be looking to introduce and train students in the uh, field of, of nursing and, you know, doctors, but we need CNAs. We need respiratory therapists. 
We need physical therapists. We need uh, phlebotists. We need all of these healthcare uh, areas. We need to get them filled. And we are running real short because people are, are, are burning out, but they also aging out. And with, with this happening, uh, if we don't change and, and try and figure out a different way of interesting people in the healthcare industry, then we may have a, a real major concern on down the road here. So this healthcare high school would be one in which uh, UAB would actually help us in terms of staffing, staffing the uh, uh, teachers that will teach the healthcare science portion. But we all it we will also have uh, teachers that will actually do the teaching of your English, your math, and from from my day and time it was uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic. <laughs> not not arithmetic, arithmetic. But uh, they we would have teachers there that would do that. But this would be more of a opportunity for students to have uh, hands-on training, uh, observing and learning prior to even going off to college and having to make a declaration of what they want to be. Representative McCampbell, thank you for stopping by and we'll be on the lookout because pretty soon <laughs> you and your uh, fellow lawmakers will be here and things will be getting busy. They will be getting real busy. <laughs> okay. Representative A.J. McCampbell, thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And we'll be right back on Capitol Journal. You're watching Alabama Public Television. Welcome back. The city of Montgomery is mired in history, covering the entire state of Alabama and the southeast. But even if you walk downtown, you will see vestiges of history from Dexter King Memorial Baptist Church to the state capitol. There's also history that is being made, and on Dexter Avenue, you'll find one of those locations. It's a new school called Valiant Cross, and here to talk about that new facility is its head, Anthony Brock. Mr. Brock, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Let me get a little background from you, if I can, because, as I said, Alabama, Montgomery is mired in history. Absolutely. You're a native of Montgomery, are you not? Absolutely. Born and raised in Montgomery. I'm the youngest of five uh, kids, mm -hmm. born to Leo and Susie Brock. Uh, and uh, like I said, my family's longtime educators. My father was a pastor. He was also a, a public school principal. Mom was a teacher. You know, most of my siblings and relatives are um, Alabama State graduates and also educators. So, yes, I'm... My DNA is here in Alabama. I, I'm proud to uh, be from this Montgomery soil. So, uh, yeah, there you have it. And so I'm, I'm quite sure you're aware of the history in this area. As you said, your family is involved in it as well. Absolutely. And you also said that you're very, very deep in education. Would, would it be fair to say education runs through your veins? Absolutely. Education runs through my veins. I've been um, in education since 1999. And um, again, like all my families in education, all my degrees are in education. That's all I've ever wanted to do. Just growing up in a, in a home with educators, seeing the impact that my parents had on so many young people uh, throughout the years inspired me to want to go in that route as well. So after college? Yes. You're going through that, let me find out what I'm going to do stage. Mm -hmm. Is that when the thought of maybe doing something like Valiant Cross crossed into your, crossed into your mind, sir? Well, it actually did not. Um, right out of uh, Alabama State, when I finished in 1999, I took a job over in the Otago County School System. Um, I did everything from teach, from coach. Uh, I was a physical education teacher at one point, a principal, assistant principal. but. Uh, during that time there, I started a mentoring program called Brother to Brother and Sister to Sister. Uh, we were just staying after school, working with young people. It was at that time that that seed was planted in me. And, uh, you know, even to go back further, uh, not just from my upbringing, but during my time at Alabama State, you know, sometimes I would go home with some of my friends and I realized they didn't have that family structure that I grew up with. And so I think God was just kind of molding me and shaping me at that time to have a heart to stand in the gap for as many young people as I could. So when did the process of putting what is now Valiant Cross together start for you? Sure. So um, 
So I was a principal at the alternative school in Prattville at that time called the Second Chance Program. Uh, my brother Fred took the athletic director and head coach position at St. Jude Educational Institute. I started coming by visiting and uh, the director talked about, you know, maybe bringing me on as the principal after a lot of prayer, looking at the rich history of St. Jude and the role it played in the Civil Rights Movement. My wife's a St. Jude grad. You know, I, I grew up knowing about St. Jude and so it was appealing to me. And I thought, you know, St. Jude could be that mecca for education here in the Southeast, which it has been for years. It's a, such a strong institution, so many great graduates. And so I took that role on, and that's how I came back to Montgomery via St. Jude. Uh, the school was, I was there only for one year. Uh, we had the basketball team that just won two state championships, football, uh, had a good year. PTA was good, the alumni was good, and then, yeah, uh, needless to say, the school closed after that year. It was at that time when I said, you know, do I go back and take a position as a principal at a public school? Do I go start? apply for a job at the State Department or do I go forward with something that God had put inside of me which was to open up an all-male school. So in 2014 we did a proof of concept year where Fred and I traveled, looked at a lot of schools, did a lot of professional development, went door to door in West Montgomery, uh, Washington Park, Gibbs Village and we convinced 30 young men to start uh, at Valiant Cross in 2015. And here we are today, here 2024. Are today. Absolutely. That's my first time hearing that, 2024. Yes, 2024, right. yes, yes, indeed. And what do we have now in terms of what is Valiant Cross? Yeah, so fast forward to today, we have uh, about 210 amazing, brilliant young brothers uh, at two campuses. One of our campuses is on Dexter. Uh, the other is on Troy University and Montgomery's uh, campus as well. So we have 210 amazing young men. We have a variety of programs. We have young men who are participating in dual enrollment with Troy University Montgomery, with Faulkner, with Trenum State Technical College. Um, some are competing in our, or in our Cisco networking program. We have a barbering academy at the school, a Red Tails Flight Academy. Uh, we have a young man who just launched his own business yesterday. So they're doing so many things um, that I didn't plan. I didn't put it on paper, but as the school unfolds, every time an opportunity presents itself that uh, we can present to these young men, we're open to it. And these scholars, because you refer to them as scholars, Absolutely. correct, have gone on, needless to say, to start doing some great things. Sure. Uh, there have been those who have gone, definitely gone on to college and, and, and graduated from college. And you Not get, graduated yet, so we've had two oh, classes. Two classes, Yeah, I'm so sorry. we do have some at Morehouse, well, one at Morehouse, we have a lot at Alabama State, some at Troy University, we have a young man up at Alabama, uh, some in the Marines, some in the Army, uh, so a few of them went straight into the workforce, which is good, whatever your, uh, when we first started the school, I said I wanted all these young men to go to college, but whatever God purposed in their heart to do, or whatever God put on them and their passion, that's what success is to us, and so whatever that is throughout the years, that's what we're going to try to guide them through too, uh, through internships, through shadowing programs. We want them to, to live a high quality of life, and so that's where our focus is now. All male school, I don't think we've heard of yeah. that in many years. Many not years. saying that it hasn't been done, it's sure. not possible, it is very much possible as you have exhibited with Valley Cross. Sure. Was that basically one of the top tiers of what you wanted to do when, it's, when action started going to motion? Absolutely, um, you know, just being an African-American male myself, just thinking I can relate to these young men and talk about some of the pitfalls or some of the things I may have done that they don't have to step into these stumbling blocks. Uh, just the relatability to them. I look like them. I can um, have good dialect, pull them to the side. But that's what I've always wanted to do. And by having an all-male school, I found out that a lot of times they're, they're not as apprehensive to maybe answer a question or to read out loud. Now, if it was an all-male school back when I was coming up, I would have fought tooth and nail. Uh, to go there, like some of them do now. Everybody that comes there don't want to go there, right? But the parents sometimes know that this is the best situation for their young men. And it's not the answer to everybody, but I think it's a really good answer to African-American young men here uh, in the city right now. Speaking of being the answer, it's actually answered the question for a lot of people here within the state, sure. but also people outside the state. It's got gotten some national acclaim, if you will, yes. all the way to Washington, D.C., New York, you name it. People have noticed Valiant Cross. There have been a number of accolades you have and your school have re recently received. Uh, tell us a little bit about some of the, those things that have happened to you. Yeah, well, a few years back, we were first recognized by the USA Today uh, as a community that thrives school, and so we received that grant some years ago, but recently we uh, 
won first place in the, the YAS Prize, which is considered the Pulitzer Prize of Education. Uh, it's a grant that, well not grant, it's a, we applied for it out of 2,000 applicants. It was narrowed down to 64 and then 33 and uh, ended up being one person who won and, and we were blessed enough to win it. You know, we had no idea, very shocked when they called our name because there were so many really strong schools and programs that were out there that were that were competing for that prize as well. But it's a, it's a testament not, um, I will say not to myself and my brother Fred, who's the co-founder. It's, it's more of a testament to the staff at that school, at our school. We have a very dedicated staff who goes over and beyond for these young men day after day. There's some selfless people who, whose name may not get called as much, but they are the real secret sauce behind Valley and Cross Academy. Now, because you won this prize, there was some financial gift coming into Absolutely. it. Absolutely, uh, million dollars. Am I correct? Million dollars. Yes. Outstanding because this is the first time that it has happened to an Alabama school, is it not? Yes, we had uh, we had a school in the semifinals. Uh, I think it was last year, Pritchard Prep, which is a really strong school uh, down in the Mobile and the Pritchard area. So when people hear about this, what is what is their reaction when they hear Valiant Cross won this award? Yeah, so everybody's uh, asking ever since, uh, what are we going to do with this? prize money, but it's already uh, mandated and dictated and we've already, the pitch that we had to do kind of told what we wanted to do with the money, which I'm going to pull back now and say we're going to make a big announcement on January the 18th, which is next Thursday at the school. Uh, the Yas family will be visiting for their first time ever uh, to the state of Alabama, so we're excited to host them uh, next week here and we'll be announcing the first step in the first tier of what we're going to do with that prize money. As I started off by saying, there's a lot of history in Alabama, in Montgomery. Mm -hmm. Valiant Cross has earned that spot right off Dexter Avenue of being not just a part physically of the landscape of Montgomery, yeah. but also history as well too. That has to make you, your staff, and those young men feel very proud of themselves. Absolutely. And you said earned. I think it's more of a it was favored because uh, mm -hmm. I don't think we, uh, we we didn't write the plans to be there the way it happened the, the Methodist Church had some space mm -hmm. and we started leasing it and now the building is ours uh, but uh, we always want to thank them and include them in the store the United Methodist Church for allowing us to be in that space on Dexter Avenue across from Dr. King's Church on the same street where Rosa Parks stepped into history and the Selma to Montgomery March the big slave market at the end of the street there's so much history that's in walking distance of these young men and I never take it for granted that that's where this school is educating African American young males or boys of color because we have some Hispanic uh, young men as well. And history has come to you all because I can remember a time where there was some movie activity in downtown Montgomery. Sure. Uh, the actor Michael B. Jordan yes. came by for a visit. He did. He heard about the school uh, that was right across the street when they were shooting uh, Brian Stevenson's True Justice, and mm -hmm. so he came across the street toward the school. You know, I always thank Brian Stevenson for allowing us to be in uh, True Justice, his documentary, but they were shooting Just Mercy when he came over. Um, and we also have a PBS documentary that's still on the app called Fruit, uh, shot by Ricardo Bates, a former student of mine, and uh, John Cook did some of the, uh, the film filmography in it as well. And, they listed me as an executive producer, but I don't know how much of an executive producer I was on it. 200 scholars right now. Mm -hmm. I'm quite sure there are more who are interested in coming in. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So um, part of our announcement will touch on some of that. Um, our, our goal is to impact as many young men as possible. Um, I think it's important that we get men back in the house. We need to, to form that, that, that structure of having that dad in the house to kind of tell you don't go astray or to reel you back in like my dad did oftentimes uh, when he sees you uh, going astray. So, you know, that's that's what we want to create uh, or help create uh, strong fathers and strong husbands and strong community leaders here in Montgomery and throughout the nation. And we encourage them to come back to Montgomery as well. Now, if they go somewhere else after college, that's fine after the military, but we really want them to come back and invest in their community uh, because we need leaders here. And real quickly, if anybody needs information about Valiant Cross, where can they go to? Our website is uh, valiantcross.org, uh, and our Facebook page is Valiant Cross Academy. My name's Principal Brock, Brock on Instagram and uh, on Facebook as well, so they can get any information they need, or they can stop by the school at 301 Dexter Avenue or the high school at um, 136 Katoma Street. 
Principal Anthony Brock of Valiant Cross, thank you for joining us and thank you for shedding some light on Valiant Cross. We thank really do appreciate having. you coming. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Take yes, care. Sir, likewise. And we'll be back with more Capital Journal. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online at video.aptv.org. Capital Journal episodes are also available on APTV's free mobile app. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. And you can listen to past episodes of Capital Journal when you're driving or on the go with Capital Journal Podcasts. Leaders in the state of Alabama are always looking for ways to help improve the Alabama education system and even the workforce. Well, one entity that has a keen interest in both is the Alabama Community College System. Joining us right now to talk about that is Dr. Chris Cox with the Alabama Community College System. Dr. Cox, thank yeah. you for joining us. Well, thanks for having us. Yeah. Good Quick question. Yes, sir. Are you a native of here, of Alabama, sir? Uh, well, I grew up in Alabama. I grew up in Geneva, Alabama. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm actually moved there when I was a very young child. So I call Alabama home. I claim it as home. Okay. Yeah. So tell me, how did you get into the education system and the Alabama Community College system? Yeah, I, well, it's a long story. I'll try to make it short. But I started as a K-12 educator and actually started when I was 20 years old as an instructional aide. And uh, at that point, just... Uh, started coaching, got my teaching degree while I was coaching and as an aide and uh, from there just went into administration and about six years ago had an opportunity to come over the community college system and uh, it's, it's been a great, great uh, change for me and I love K-12 but it, it also gives me insight in that bridge from K-12 to the community college system. So, love being here. And it's a busy bridge indeed because the community college system is very busy. As a matter yes. of fact, for you guys, a report came out that said enrollment is up. And as a, also another result is building and expanding the community college system as well too. Let's talk about that because enrollment, that's yeah. a huge plus. Oh yeah, enrollment's up. And honestly, we're, we're defying the odds nationally. Everything you read and you see the data of community colleges around the country enrollment is down but I think if I'm, I'm going to quote our uh, Vice Chancellor of Student Services I think we're up around seven percent uh, for this spring semester which is just uh, it's, it's huge and it, it, it's a credit to our colleges their presidents the leadership and then obviously the faculty and staff and there that's where the rubber meets the road when you have an instructor and a teacher uh, working with a student, it's uh, that's where change happens, and that's where lives get changed and saved, in my opinion. And you, you made a good point there. Lives get changed because you're talking about getting ready to step out into the world, being a prepared person, but also being prepared to join a workforce, which Alabama is always being courted for by businesses and other entities coming to the state. One of the primary reasons is Alabama has a great workforce and community college system has a, has a big role in that. Yeah, I, I mean, I really believe everything we do is workforce. You know, um, we're unique and uh, really no one else does what we do. And that is we transfer students, they can come to us in their own community, get quality transfer courses if they wanna go to any of our great universities in the state. But also if they want a two year career technical degree that will put them to work, whether it be nursing, welding, industrial maintenance, all the important things are there, but also we do short skilled training. So we can take someone that is, uh, you know, just wanting, needing a job very quickly and we can upskill them. And, and believe, we believe that the, the skills, they can get into a livable wage job fairly quickly. So yeah, it's, it, we're pretty nimble and uh, I think we're doing really good things in the state. And like you said, leading this country in terms of what community college systems can do. Yeah, and, and you know, I think uh, Chancellor Baker, who is our leader, has just, he, he's, he's never satisfied. As long as there's someone else in the state of Alabama that needs upskilling and needs to find a better quality of life, he pushes, pushes us daily to get better and try to seek that person out and most importantly, help them. Now also another caveat of all the success is physical new expansion as well too. 
Yes, there's a lot of construction going on through the state of Alabama. We have uh, great leadership in our office. Mark Selman's uh, handling a lot of that, but working with our colleges and the presidents. But, you know, we're seeing workforce centers uh, being built around the state. We are seeing, you know, our, our, our campuses, uh, many of them are 60 years and older. And, um, you know, we are really trying to get those uh, facilities to a place where you know, a lot of new high schools are being built, and if someone leaves a high school and comes to community college, we want to feel like they have left and come to college. And that means in our technical fields or whatever training, we want to feel like they're moving closer to a quality career. So, yeah, it's so important, the capital projects that are taking place. Something else that's getting ready to take place here in the state, the legislature will be starting their new regular session for this year. Lawmakers are always interested in what you and your agency, they're doing. Yes because of course that leads to providing a better workforce for the state. Yes, and, and we're excited about this session. We're thankful for our delegation. They've been so supportive of the work we're doing. We're excited about this session because we really believe we've got some, some good plans as far as uh, impacting. One of the things that I think is a bud, buzzword in the state right now because it's somewhat of a problem is labor force participation. and. Uh, we feel like we have a foundational plan of how we can work with our K-12 friends with, and I have met with Dr. Mackey and his team of how we can work out a bridge to make sure that no student leaves high school without having a plan of being able to get into the workforce. It's like a seamless connection between entities. It's a seamless connection and, and we're hoping to get some, uh, hope hopefully be able to let students know at a young age and around ninth grade because students can start with us in 10th grade. They can start with us in dual enrollment. They can take our skills for success training, which is training such as um, an excavator, driving an excavator or hospitality and tourism for our friends down south. And, you know, all the industry sectors, we're going to have some quick training that students can take advantage of while in high school. So we want to be able to expose them in ninth grade so that they know the opportunities that are available as they're going through 10th, 11th and 12th grade. And then uh, we're, we're really, um, we're hoping that our delegation can support us getting a mentorship program that will actually, at the end of uh, their senior year, that there's mentors there that come from business, industry, faith-based faith organizations, um, just the community itself that come together and are able to plug the students into either if they're transferring to a university, this is maybe some assistance you need, or if you need a job, the mentor may be the person that can offer them that job and get them into a career. So. That's some of the, and, and we're really, there's a lot of research that's went into this. It's not just, hey, we're saying we're going to have mentors. Today, the state of Tennessee has about 9,000 mentors that are bridging the gap from career technical education into the workforce. And uh, because we've researched that model, we believe we can be just as good as Tennessee. So that's something we're, we're uh, proposing in this session to be able to, to get mentors to engage. So now when we have, I, I call it, uh, I call May uh, and graduation unemployment day where we have around 40,000 uh, students in the state that graduate high school and generally they're unemployed. And uh, we want to make that a day that it's not an unemployment day, that there is a plan for every student to be able to have something that is meaningful and can put them to work and have a livable wage. And you just mentioned something which I remember talking to members of the legislature about. Alabama is in competition with surrounding states about helping get that workforce up and out. That's right. And represent it. That, that's right. We, we have to get them engaged. And I think and we believe that some of that is just because of knowledge of what's out there, having an opportunity to explore it. And, um, you know, we, we believe our 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 students that are in our schools are better than anywhere in the country. Uh, we believe that Alabama has the best and we, we believe that we have to equip them and get them ready. And right now, because unfortunately about half of our students that graduate high school in May, half of them, if, if the data continues, half of those students are not seeking any post-secondary training. Mm -hmm. And what we know is that 
to, to get a job that has a livable wage most of the time has to have some some sort of skill or training. So that's why we're working with our friends at uh, K-12 and with Dr. Mackey and his team and the board over there so that we can bridge that gap. And what we hope is, and we believe it, the hope is that we can get that 50% or almost 50% that's not seeking post-secondary training. If we can bring that down, those percentages down, we're gonna see the percentage of labor force participation go down and it's a foundational fix so our children and grandchildren one day are going to reap the benefits for the investment in the program. Dr. Uh, Chris Cox with Alabama Community College System thank you for joining us and thank you for sure. telling us about what you yes, guys sir. are up to. Thank you. We'll be watching Pleasure. please uh, keep us up to speed. Will do. Thanks so much. <laughs> thank you All sir. Right. And Capital Journal will be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online anytime at Alabama Public Television's website, aptv.org. Montgomery native Percy L. Julian was an internationally acclaimed chemist. The third African American to receive a PhD in chemistry, he specialized in the chemistry of natural products and their synthesis in the laboratory. This technology is very important in medicines, food products, paints, and firefighting foams, among other things. Julian received many awards, including election to the National Academy of Sciences and the National Inventors Hall of Fame. That will do it for this edition of Capital Journal. Be sure to join us again next week for an all-new program featuring statewide news. I'm Randy Scott, and for all of us here at Alabama Public Television, we thank you for watching. Have a good evening, and be careful.